Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Damara Smith, Executive Director of the National Football League Players Association, which represents 1,900 NFL professionals. Damaris was elected unanimously to head the association in 2009 and led negotiations between players and owners in 2011. He is a former federal prosecutor and counsel to then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder. Damaris has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Damaris, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so interested in talking with you about unions today, given what is going on in the news, the various um, uh, legislation that is scattered throughout the country, uh, in Michigan, Ohio, uh, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and other places. What is the meaning of unions these modern days? Yeah, I think you have two uh, really fundamental uh, views of, of unions and, and the role that they're going to play, uh, both in the lives of working men and women in America. From the perspective of the individual employee, they know, and they should know, that unions are typically the only thing that can fight for their rights effectively in a way that an ordinary man, woman couldn't fight for himself in the marketplace. The other view, of course, is the view that you get from uh, people who look at unions as a hindrance um, to, to pro productivity or, or uh, uh, corporate benefits. Uh, there can be nothing uh, that is more distorted than, than that view. Uh, when we talk to our players about the importance of their union, certainly it's a little bit easier to remind them on a day like today when uh, four players who were accused of, of, uh, of offenses that um, uh, just yesterday uh, they, they were found not to be accused of. The reason all four of those uh, players were, were absolved and exonerated is their union fought for them. And any one player standing in that breach by himself would not have the power to fight the National Football League, would not have the, the wherewithal to expend the resources that we did uh, to fight. That's fundamentally the same situation that I think every man um, and woman who works for a living uh, in this country faces. And you find today that ordinary men and women who are working in America are at even a greater disadvantage to fight for the things that we would all consider to be um, uh, fair compensation. Um, pensions are under attack. Health care is under attack. Having a safe workplace is under attack. And I can certainly understand why a corporation would not want to fight a collective group of individual workers who have band together to fight for all three of those things because they know that one individual worker fighting for those things is utterly helpless. Privacy, safety, equal treatment. Well, and all of those things are American ideals. Those are things that, that your parents, my parents, and hopefully my kids will continue to fight for uh, for the rest of their lives. And, and watching those things uh, continue to be encroached upon, um, those things that uh, some people on the Hill like to call entitlements, well, those are basic fundamental principles that each and every person should want uh, for their children in the workplace. And I know that from our own union, uh, the thing why, I, uh, one of the reasons why I certainly enjoy my job, you know, people have an idea that football players um, are, are probably a, a group of people who l need a union the least. Well, the reality of it is, is our first strike by a group of players was over whether um, the owners would contribute one dollar to a pension fund. Um, our union was formed by uh, football greats uh, like Don Shula because the teams refused to wash our players' clothes after they went to work. So we were literally a union that was created over things that we called dirty socks and dirty jocks. And today in 2012, uh, uh, we have a collective bargaining agreement for the first time where we had to fight for the right of every team physician to be subject to every federal, state, and local regulation. The thing that I don't understand is that the corporate law, the act of incorporation is actually an act in which investors combine Correct. to create a platform from which they can invest and be represented for their investments. It's a platform from which they, can, they are enabled to speak Correct. with one voice. Could one actually imagine an attack 
on that essential ability that could preserve business as, as we know it. If we cannot combine, can we really uh, pool our funds to invest in any efficient way? The answer would be no. Absolutely. So isn't the act of unionization simply the mirror the flip of that side. from the combining of individuals so that they can be represented in terms of the work that they provide to investors um, and, and to people who are engaging in, in capital investment. You know, absolutely. And, and, and here is the ultimate hypocrisy. Um, that ability to, to organize, to take advantage of collective action, to speak with one voice, to be shielded in a way from, um, from things that would inhibit your ability to maximize resources and, you know, and profits, um, truthfully, no person who believes in American business can truthfully say that there is, uh, that unions are not the philosophical corollary or the mirror of what's happening on, on the corporate side. No one with a shred of, of honesty or at least intellectual honesty um, will say that. What they will say and what they have said privately is frankly, they'd rather not have unions around because you can always find someone who's willing to work more cheaply, somebody who's willing to work without health insurance, someone who is not going to force a corporation to, to keep a workplace as safe as possible. And the reason why I know that's true is that is exactly the history that our NFL Players Union had with the NFL owners. Um, framed in my office is a letter from one of the, the first player reps after a meeting with the NFL owners when a group of players went in and said, we want to be able to represent ourselves collectively in order to ensure more fairness in the National Football League. And the letter that I have framed in my office uh, reports to all of the players who were then playing about how the owners refused to recognize this group, would not deal with them and give them the authority to bargain uh, with themselves, and told them that if they ever dared to form a union, none of those players would work again. And our union, just like every union in the country, is built um, uh, where it stands on the shoulders of people who fought those battles before. And our union is no different. Um, uh, we tell the story of, of a player who went to war, drafted to war, a man named Bill Radovich, uh, who went into the service, came back to work for the Detroit Lions. Um, he learned that his father was dying in California and Bill wanted to leave the Detroit Lions, move to a California team to be closer to his dying father. The owner of the Detroit Lions said, if you ever leave the Detroit Lions, you'll never play for another NFL team. And he didn't. Um, but he took it upon himself as an individual to sue the National Football League um, and, and proved that that blackballing of him by all of the other teams, to use your point, who had then combined to maximize their own benefits, he successfully took his case to the U.S. Supreme Court and won. And that is the precedent that establishes that the league must abide by the antitrust laws. So fast forward to 2010, where uh, a player named Drew Brees and a guy named Tom Brady and a guy named Peyton Manning decide to sue the National Football League for violating the antitrust laws. The first case cited is one by Bill Radovich from 1946. So, you know, look, uh, we are in a, a, a world now where um, um, corporations believe um, that they can, can maximize their own profits at the expense or on the backs of people who actually perform the work. Unions get in the way of that. And, and their lobbying efforts in Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, as of late, um, and, and the other states that, that you've mentioned, are concerted attacks on working men and women. No more, no less. And, and for us, for, for our union, while we might be a very small one that has somewhat of a niche uh, market, um, we believe, our players believe, I certainly believe that we have a larger obligation to organize labor. Uh, that's why I sit on the executive committee of the AFL-CIO. That's why our players were on the picket lines in Wisconsin. Um, that's why our players lobbied in Michigan. Um, because I do believe that, that our issues as players, a decent pension, um, a safe workplace, um, if you get hurt at work, 
that the employer is actually obligated to take care of your medical bills. And a right to advocate, a, li a, a, a right to speak with one voice. Right um, to representation. You know, if, if, if you're a shareholder of a major corporation, you don't get a vote on whether that organization um, can lobby politically or whether there are any contributions right. made to a congressperson. Uh, even if you're a large sh uh, shareholder, unless you are a dominant shareholder, you don't get a voice Absolutely not. on, on uh, what investments are being made. What I would like to see is business starting to, and, and there are business leaders who feel this way, and they should stand up and express it, defining the relationship that they would like to have with unions and engaging with unions on the type of positive partnership that they would, they would embrace in ways to accomplish the objectives of both. If the game gets stronger, mm -hmm. players will not object, owners will not object, right. fans will not object. That's it is right. the interests of all. Correct. And so talking, wasting this, this incredible energy that is surrounding this game in conflict instead of in, in productive uh, change. Right, building. Uh, building, protecting the players. Correct. Protecting the game. It is, and it was, one of the most frustrating parts of our, our uh, process of collective bargaining. Um, I mean, for example, uh, I'll never forget a day when the league came to us. They had four big interests uh, uh, in changing the collective bargaining agreement. One, they wanted the players to take a 20% pay cut. Yes. Uh, they wanted so the money. players money. They wanted to give up, make the players give up their defined uh, benefit plan, pensions. Pensions, right? They wanted the players to play two more games, workplace safety, right? Um, and they wanted the players to agree to a rookie wage scale, economic depression. Those are our issues, um, and and their purported uh, justification for that was the system is not working for us. Well. You know, with all due respect to them, our players play for 3.5 years. Um, the injury rate in the National Football League is 100%. Those are the two things that define our paradigms. Now, on the flip side, owners own teams for decades, and the last time I checked, not one owner got hurt at work. So when we were trying to try to reach a balance, um, I said to them, fine, if the system is not working for you, why don't we do this? Our players would gladly give up 20% of their salaries for a 20% ownership interest in the National Football League. Our players would be interested in playing two more games if they shared in, in the greater asset growth that would come from that. Um, our players would be happy to talk about changes to their uh, pension plan if they truly became partners in ownership in the same way that the sons and daughters of our owners uh, ultimately inherit um, what our players build. Our owners weren't interested in any of that uh, because it demonstrated that when it came time for the rubber to meet the road, they actually weren't interested in their employees being their partners. And the same is true when you look at these fundamental attacks on working men and women. How many working men and women who work for these large corporations uh, would be willing to give up part of their salaries if they truly then owned portions of what they work Well, with. you'd be surprised. Uh, corporations, um, uh, particularly innovative corporations, startups and so on, they grant options. They do, and that's the difference. Um, the people who want to grow as a partnership grow. The people who want to grow off the backs of the people who are actually doing the work don't want to share. So when you see this move of we want to turn each and every one of our employees into quote unquote independent contractors, that's a fundamental deliberate decision that we don't want you to be a part of anything that we build. So uh, something like an option pool that is administered by uh, the union for the benefit of players, that so far has not been the kind of idea that has been embraced. And, and never will be. You know, I tend to be a, a student of history, both, um, both in our organization and, and generally. Um, we don't have a partnership with the owners of the National Football League. Um, we should, but we don't. Um, and, and for our players and for our members, I make it abundantly clear that the owners view our players as replaceable and fungible. 
And, and any player who thinks that that relationship is any different is doomed to have their feelings hurt. So in your view, it's, it's an extractive process and part of your, um, your role is to balance that extractive process Absolutely. and to protect people for the rest of their lives beyond their three, four, five year of playing. Uh, career. What about the, the various uh, issues surrounding uh, things like the use of uh, human growth hormone, mm -hmm. that kind of testing, mm -hmm. uh, the issues that have uh, gained so much prominence in, in alcohol yep. uh, use and so on and so forth, concussions, uh, change to the rules of the game and so on. What are your roles in those various issues? As a union, we're vitally involved in, in all of them. Um, we, we have a very good uh, collective bargaining agreement. Uh, the reason why we have a good collective bargaining agreement is uh, we have a very strong union. Um, uh, if, uh, if our union wasn't, uh, wasn't strong, didn't have the ability of creating uh, somewhat of a balanced document uh, or agreement between the owners and players, um, there would be labor peace. It would just be the labor peace that comes from someone being able to force you to do whatever you wanted to do. Um, so when it comes to all of those issues, whether it affects player health and safety or whether it affects the workplace, uh, those are issues where um, uh, very few changes, fundamental changes can be made without agreements on, on both sides. And to me, that's the strength of a collective bargaining agreement. So. Um, with respect to HGH, for example, our, our players want a free, um, a clean and, and drug-free game. At the same time, uh, while the league wants to turn over the administration of the HGH test to the World Anti-Doping Association, one of the issues that we have, as well as um, uh, issues that uh, Olympic athletes have, is that WADA has never disclosed the science underlying how they conduct the HGH test and how they make comparisons in order to determine whether or not a player has been adjudicated as taking um, illegal HGH. So our feeling is, is somewhat rather simple. We believe in any system that is transparent because that is the only way that we can make sure that the system is fair. So far, both the National Football League and WADA have refused to turn over um, all of the um, uh, background and all of the materials that go into... And the logic the that, 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 that uh, is claimed is that if they turn over the test, then there are ways to work out very quickly how to... You know, actually, they, they haven't claimed that. Uh, what they have claimed is that their science is proprietary. Uh, I believe that their real concern is that if they turn over the information, that someone else will come up with a bigger, better HGH test, and they will lose... Uh, their ability to corner the market. Now, uh, you know, from a, from a proprietary standpoint, I can certainly understand that. That's why we've agreed to sign any sort of confidentiality agreement. But, but the problem that I have with the way in which uh, at least WADA um, conducts that system, if you're an athlete um, and they've adjudicated you as taking HGH and you ask a very simple question, how did you reach that decision? they will tell you because we have. If history is any more of a guide of the, the present, if you then take a course of action against WADA to try to um, understand the basis for their adjudication, they will extend the amount of time that they have suspended you from your sport. So the price of, of the acceptance by the association and by players is transparency is an ability to understand sure. what is going on with their body, with their privacy, and to be able to respond um, fairly. fairly and, and if there's a disagreement, we, would, we agree to submit it to a neutral arbitrator to decide. And in terms of... of it seems eminently fair. Well, it, it, it seems <laughs> a common sense approach. I, and I, I do understand people wanting to uh, maintain their trade secrets. Sure. But you do see confidentiality agreements signed. On a, on a pretty regular basis. It is the kind of uh, approach that businesses use all the time to share very sensitive information. Well, we'll look at uh, steroid testing. The science is transparent. Alcohol testing, science is transparent. Marijuana, cocaine, any sort of uh, prescription medication test. I don't know of a test that is commonly administered uh, to people where the science 
isn't transparent except for one, HGH. And, and so I don't understand the concern about transparency. I don't understand uh, the hesitancy of uh, turning it over to a neutral arbitrator. And I certainly don't understand why they would prevent you from raising any legitimate concerns that you have about the test. And, and, and to me, um, it, it becomes even more absurd when both the National Football League and the players agreed, okay, fine, WADA doesn't want to turn over uh, uh, their quote-unquote secret sauce, so here's what we'll do. Why don't we agree on an independent doctor to conduct a population study and basically recreate the same population study um, that WADA created in order to, to make adjudication determinations? The league agreed to do that. Um, over a year ago, the league's doctor decided to back out and not do the study, and the league has not picked a new doctor. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. We're also all very concerned about the prevalence of injuries, and particularly the, the character of injuries that um, uh, NFL players absorb mm -hmm. um, over the course of their careers. Whether you are a coal miner or you're working in a chemical plant, whether you are working on the football field or you're working with uh, toxic materials to build electronics, yeah. there are workplace issues. Talk about the, the personal safety issues that your uh, members confront. Well, and, and those are, are issues that are probably first and foremost um, of importance to our, our members, our players, and, and thus the creation of our union. You know, and again, um, history as a guide. We, we teach and talk to our players about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Why? Um, because when, when hundreds or dozens of, of, of young women and, and, and children were killed in a fire, it was their working conditions that subjected them to not only the risk of that fire occurring, but also their inability uh, to get out of that, that building before they burned to death. Our union uh, is one where, as I've said before, the injury rate is 100%. That's the National Football League's number. Last year, we had nearly 4,500 reported injuries in the National Football League. Um, we only have 1,900 players. So um, the, the issue uh, of safety is, is predominant. And, and the simple way of articulating the, the player's position is that we would like the National Football League to simply recognize that when injuries occur in our workplace, unlike virtually every, every other place, those injuries are not accidents. If you or I had the unlucky occurrence of being squared up uh, uh, against Ray Lewis with him coming at us full speed, Whatever would happen after shut my that, eyes. <laughs> um, and, and both of us would probably have our eyes shut for a very long period of time. Um, whatever happens after a player meets a linebacker uh, where they're both over 200 pounds and, and moving at that kind of speed, whatever happens after that is not an accident. Right. It's a necessary and foreseeable consequence of the workplace in which our players work. So does that mean that the league has an obligation to, to, to try to make the workplace as safe as possible? Yes. So that's why we, we, um, we are interested in the type of equipment that's provided. At the same time, however, the one thing that the league uh, fails to do is to embrace those injuries as the necessary and foreseeable consequence of our players' job duties. So for example, when our players file for workers' compensation for the injuries that they suffer at work, um, the National Football League opposes them. When, when they go to see team doctors uh, about their injuries and we know that players have suffered an injury X, Y, and Z, we have team doctors who nonetheless tell our players that they're okay. So when, when it comes to the issue, like for example, of concussions, um, the, the league has taken the approach that there are two fundamental problems with concussions. One, um, illegal hits and players who fail to report their injuries. Um, let's just put a pin in those for right now. Um, the league continues to take that position even at the same time that they have rejected 
having a sideline concussion expert at a game who's not affiliated with either team. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't honestly and intellectually uh, uh, believe that the issue of concussions boils down to I need to find more players for bad hits um, and I need to, to make sure that players report all of their injuries. Are those two things important? Yes, but to focus on those things in isolation and ignore uh, your obligation to treat players who are injured, to ignore your obligation to have a neutral doctor make a determination about a player, um, to, to ignore your, your ethical duty of supervising team doctors who have been uh, distributing pain-killing medication like chiclets. All of those things that are on the latter ledger, ledger are things that the league has ignored for years. And it's not as if it's not in the league's interest the players' interest, the fans' interest, to have the games be shaped to be as exciting as possible, sure. but also to allow the, those players to play the next game in, in, in as fit a condition as possible. Well, and, and hopefully transition out of football or have the hope of transitioning out of football um, where you haven't le left your best physical uh, capabilities and your best mental capabilities behind. Is part of the issue that, that players are sometimes viewed as interchangeable attributes? I, I, think, uh, I think that the, the, the problem are, are threefold. Um, one, um, I, I still believe that uh, the, the mentality that, that used to have the rule where owners could depreciate players when they sold their team, I think that Per, or persist. Well, does that does that bring up some some bad uh, Horrible. associations? Horrible. Horrible. Players as possessions. As chattel. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that culture pers persists. Um, two, um, uh, I believe that uh, given where the league is right now, facing nearly four thousand uh, concussion lawsuits, that they are viewing every decision in the prism of whether that is going to somehow compromise their legal position uh, with respect to these cases. Third, going back to a point that we discussed earlier, the league has always sought the benefits of, of cooperation or corporation when it was in their best interest, mm -hmm. but ha have always um, shielded themselves uh, under the umbrella where they are not a corporation when, when that also inures to their benefit. So um, I'm sure everybody knows that the National Football League is a, a 401 nonprofit entity. Right. That is, is um, uh, collectively made up of their 32 teams. They use that as a shield when it is in their best interest. Um, and I think the, the last piece is it, it, at times when they should be looking at instituting league-wide rules. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, sort of feudal nature of their organization in inhibits that. Are there certain teams, certain owners, that are more sympathetic to a different model, a model in which there isn't the Players Association on the one side of the yep. table yelling, at the owners on the other side of the table, like sometimes Democrats and Republicans have been, each sort of confirming their yeah. own uh, positions, talking to their own echo chambers, and so yeah. on and so forth. But but are are there touch points? Let me answer the question uh, this way: Do I believe that there are owners who have both um, the the vision and the industry to um, to to look for uh, a relationship between players and management that is far more focused uh, on ways in which to, to grow the game and to make the game safer and better for fans, uh, players, and, and management and owners themselves, yes. A rising tide lifting all boats. A smarter way of working together. together. The history of, of our fights with the National Football League are, are ones uh, that that always bring back um, you know the, the the end of the Great Gatsby, um, yes. where each and every 
fight is one that in some way inexorably pulls us back to our past. Um, that is our relationship. And, and until we get to a, a point where someone uh, can exercise the level of vision and leadership to, to understand that we are far better off if we are working together on these common issues, um, and, and that might mean embracing things in a way that you haven't done before, but that is, but that is the march of time that we will be heading towards. Um, I, I think we're we're always better. Um, I, I do know that there are people on the other side who uh, like folks in uh, some of the states that we went, mentioned before, um, who continue to believe that in some way, shape, or form, if we can somehow get rid of this union or if we can marginalize their leadership, if we can fracture uh, their membership, then we will be able to do whatever we want to do. Um, and the simple message to them, you know, from me starting three years ago and, and from Gene Upshaw before me and from John Mackey before him and from Ed Garvey before him, uh, this is a union that is going um, to always be here. And maybe fans, the other interests that are so taken, so captivated uh, with this game um, can also play a bridge building uh, part because after all, you represent, the owners represent, the players represent an endeavor that really does affect so much of American society. Oh, oh absolutely. And, and, uh, and frankly, I'm, uh, I'm far more optimistic uh, about that now than I was. Uh, because we are seeing a, a level of concern, uh, particularly among participants in youth football, uh, about whether, um, from the parents, whether their children should, should be in, involved in this game. Respect for the referees, respect for... And, and those are things that I believed in um, when I was a player and, and as a coach now. Those are things that, that I believe to this day. But I, I do also believe that until parents and practitioners in youth sports truly believe that, that what we are doing on the highest level um, is a practice that is engaged in trying to, to enhance safety, to try to make uh, the game as safe as possible, to try to take care of the people who play it, until they see that reflected on our highest level, they are going to have a continued and growing concern about whether this sport is safe. And to me, all of us have an interest um, um, in, in ensuring that and, and, and calming and allaying those fears. But it will only come from an embracing about what the risk of football are on our level and a commitment by the people on the side of management to treat these things as necessary and foreseeable consequences of what people do at work um, and to stop the effort um, or, and this continued effort uh, of trying to enforce uh, their way to some outcome um, instead of trying to build some sort of collaborative way of reaching that outcome. Well, it's been a, a really informative discussion. I'd like to thank you uh, oh. so much, Damaris, for, for unpacking this very complicated, non-sound biteable uh, series of issues. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.